Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to our virtual community as well, joining us via Zoom. My name is Fortune Joacha, and I'm a research assistant at Krishet, but also a student of literature. Um, so my first job is to hand over to Prof. Andre Kiet, who's chair in Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, and also the DVC for the Engagement Transformation Portfolio. Thank you so much, colleagues. <laughs> And thanks for that very warm applause, okay? Thundering at best. Okay, friends and friends, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you to today's seminar on a complexity approach to decolonization in higher education by Sharon, a good friend of ours who has been involved in our network since 2019 and whose work has been a valuable resource in thinking through how to decolonize the university and what practices and orientation may support us in the process. Shannon is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia and a visiting professor with us here at Mandela University. In her work, she asks how higher education can confront local and global challenges in more socially and ecologically accountable ways, particularly in relation to decolonization, internationalization, and climate change. She is a founding member of the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective and author of Unsettling the University, Confronting the Colonial Foundations of U.S. Higher Education. She, of course, forgot to bring my copy with her, but we'll find it in another way. As Sharon notes in her abstract for today's talk, decolonization may have become a buzzword in higher education, but not always or often accompanied by action. Similarly, in the draft terms of reference for our recently established Africanization Decolonization Working Group at Mandela University, it is observed that there have not been substantive reflections on what decolonization or what decolonizing and transforming the curriculum may mean across knowledge fields, nor how the university's decolonization project should proceed. In a recently published book, The Decolonization of Knowledge, Radical Ideas, and the Shaping of Institutions in South Africa and Beyond, Janssen and Walters explored what happened to the call from the hashtag must fall movement for an affordable decolonized higher education system in 2015-2016. They came to the conclusion that institutions deployed a range of tactics in order to manage what they perceived to be a crisis, including posturing, diluting, bureaucratizing, disciplining, regulating, marginalizing, and domesticating the radical curriculum idea. I suppose you can attest to that in other parts of the world as well. That is, the radical value of decolonization in South African universities has been watered down through a set of institutional practices across the system. Thus, one of the great areas of work for Krishet relates to the arguments of subversion as put forward by Njin in reference to Moulton and Harney's Undercommons, Abelstam, the Queer Art of Failure, and La Papas in the Third University is Possible, Hartman's Wayward Life, Beautiful Experiments, and Honig's The Politics of Public Things, and those associated with abolitionist and refusal theories on higher education. That is, how do we generate and sustain spaces of radical work within university amidst the disciplining power of institutions, and how should the university facilitate its own subversion, if possible? Yet amongst these challenges, let me acknowledge the many programs and projects in our university, and some of my colleagues on the revitalization of the humanities are here. That's one of our key examples of how this work may be possible. So today's seminar is part of our collective efforts to find ways to decolonize the university despite, to quote Sharon again, the extent to which colonialism has colonized our imaginations by acknowledging and addressing the complexities involved in doing higher education otherwise. Sharon, we are thoroughly looking forward to your contribution today. Welcome back to Mandela University. It's great to have you here again. And welcome also to all of you who are attending today, both in person and online. Please feel very welcome. 
to our colleagues from the university, our students, members of the broader community, those joining from other parts of the country and abroad, we hope you will be challenged today as well as inspired to continue to pursue ways of navigating the complexities of our institutions, ourselves, in pursuit of other imaginations of the university. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Prof. Andre Kiet, for that beautiful welcome. And uh, now I'm going to hand over to Prof. Sharon Stay. Wonderful. I'm, it's hard for me to look at you because I'm being uh, attacked by these lights, but I'm very happy to be here. Okay. So um, the itinerary for my talk today is I would like to start by um, offering some acknowledgments, situating myself in this work, talking about seven complexities of the current social historical context and the implications of this for confronting colonialism in higher education, and then offer seven steps back and seven steps forward for navigating these complexities in the university. And then, of course, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion afterwards. So. Um, I want to start by acknowledging where I'm coming from um, in what is currently known as Canada, uh, specifically in what is currently known as Vancouver, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I also want to thank the traditional stewards of this place, which I admit to knowing much less about. Um, and in addition to acknowledging the peoples of these places, I want to acknowledge the lands and waters that sustain those of us who live here. Um, that are living entities in themselves, not human property, although we often treat them as such. And I hear that you're having a drought, so this feels especially important to name and appreciate. I also want to thank Andre, Jenny, Pita, and the whole Crechette crew for getting me here, making everything go so smoothly and on very short notice, and I'm very happy to be here again. The last time I was here was before the pandemic, which is almost four years ago, and a lot has changed since then, including the name of this place, um, and a lot hasn't. So I'm hoping we can discuss both of those things today. And there's a need for more than just thank yous. There's also a need to acknowledge the colonial violences that allow me to be here today. The colonization and apartheid that have shaped and scarred this place, the colonization of indigenous lands in what is currently known as Canada, where I live, and in what is currently known as the US, where I was born and raised, the carbon producing planes that allowed me to get from there to here, and the carbon emitting data centers that allow, that allow us to connect um, for those people joining via Zoom, not to mention um, the uh, minerals, the conflict minerals that have gone into creating the machines that I'm processing uh, and presenting from. So in other words, I want to name that the shiny benefits of, of modern existence are subsidized and underwritten by historical, systemic, and ongoing violence. Um, expropriation, exploitation, extraction, creating dispossession, destitution, and armed conflict, ecocides, and genocides across the globe. And this is not new to most of you. Um, some of you have already spent decades drawing attention to these colonial co uh, complicities and trying to interrupt them. Um, but in many contexts, including my own, this is still an extremely uncomfortable conversation for people to have, um, which, as you might imagine, makes me not always the most popular person with my colleagues, but <laughs> I want to thank you for creating a space in which this kind of conversation is um, not just tolerated, but welcomed and encouraged, and where we don't have to dance around the hard things. So since today's uh, presentation is about complexity, I want to just start by naming the complexities around the word decolonization, which has, of course, multiple meanings. And um, of course, it varies across time and place. Of course, I'm assuming it means something very different to you here than it does in the US or Canada, and is shaped by different thinkers, grounded in different political movements, and different context-specific forms of backlash against those movements as well, and heterogeneity within the movements. And even within one context, there are multiple contested meanings. And these meanings multiply as movements gain traction, as the term becomes popularized and appropriated, and in many cases loses its political impact. So partly because of this complexity and contestation, and partly because the word has been co-opted in extremely watered down ways, I've actually started to move away from talking about decolonization and talking instead about confronting colonialism in higher education. And I'll say just a little bit about that. 
So given the extent to which colonialism has shaped the DNA of our institutions, I don't know if it's possible to decolonize existing universities. And I'm speaking about my context. I don't know as much about yours. But even if it's possible, we're a very long way away from this. Um, white settlers in particular, like myself, continue to overestimate our preparedness to interrupt racism and colonialism and underestimate the magnitude and complexity of the work that remains to be done. In general, white people like myself haven't been able to face the full unfiltered truth about our institutional and individual complicity in harm. We have at most taken itty bitty baby steps. But many of us are eager to jump on the decolonization bandwagon, perhaps hoping that it will distract people from the fact that we're trying to transcend our complicity in colonialism without giving anything up, specifically without giving up the intergenerational social, political, and economic power and benefits that have been derived from centuries of a white supremacist system. I find that centering the work that is required for confronting colonialism is helpful in efforts to interrupt these white moves to innocence, and that this is also a more accurate description of where institutions like mine are currently at in this work, which again is much less further along than we like to think. So that's the frame that I use uh, primarily in this talk as well. Okay, one more thing. I also want to say a bit about the complexities of writing and speaking about the persistence of racial and colonial violence as a white settler from the global north who is structurally implicated in and benefits immensely from that violence. When I name these things as a white person, I get a very different response than my black and indigenous colleagues who are often silenced, ignored, or punished when they do the same. Even when I do get negative feedback, it's usually not as intense, and I have a lot of buff privileges that buffer me from the impact of that. Despite the complicated nature of doing this work as a white person, I also know that when we don't do this work of interrupting systemic colonial patterns, all the work falls on racialized people. So I do think we have a responsibility to take on more of this work without centering ourselves or attempting to speak on behalf of racialized people but instead attempting to amplify their concerns and considering our own role in those concerns. That's why I do a lot of this work collaboratively, especially with my research collective Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures, which is an interdisciplinary, international, and intergenerational collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, activists, and indigenous and Afro-descendant knowledge keepers. We work at the interface of questions related to systemic historical and ongoing violence and the unsustainability of current habits of being. Depending on our positionalities, including our race, age, gender, geographic location, profession, and individual capacities, we take on different roles in the collective. My role is to bring our work to academic spaces and specifically to invite white settlers like me to confront the colonial past and present so that we have a fighting chance for shifting our course toward futures that are not premised on the reproduction of colonial violence. And if we fail to do this, I think we might have no future at all, given the fact that colonial violence is also the root cause of the climate crisis that threatens us with premature human extinction. I know that my contribution in this work is very, very, very small and that I often fail. But I also know that failure is inevitable in this kind of work because of how counterintuitive it is to the ways we've been socialized in a deeply colonial world. And I know we can't allow the fear, fear of failure to immobilize us. We have to learn to see it as an opportunity for further learning and unlearning with honesty, humility, and hyper self-reflexivity. So those are my caveats. I, I'm getting to the point where my whole talks are just gonna be the caveats. Maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna review now is seven complexities of the current social historical context and think about their implications for how we might confront colonialism in higher education. The first is the VUCA context, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I think it emerged out of marketing um, research, which is not the best, but I think we can use and abuse it in different ways. Um, so thinking about the volatility of our political economic systems, as well as our internal landscapes, uncertainty about the future, and especially in relation to the ability of our existing systems to adapt or not to current and coming challenges, complexity within and between different communities, and ambiguity about 
well, pretty much everything, including about how we should respond to this VUCA context. So thinking about some of the implications of VUCA for confronting colonialism in higher education, um, the hegemony of neoliberal institutional ethos and financial austerity measures in the form of budget cuts, declining public funding and tuition fees, the economic precarity of many staff, faculty, and students, which we see in rising student loans, food and housing insecurity, and the impacts of inflation, political and social polarization, which has led to both high and low intensity conflicts on campuses and beyond, the intensity of ecological crises, extreme weather, droughts, tipping points, and overall an impending sense of doom that many of my students are feeling very strongly and technological innovation, especially the recent proliferation of AI, and much, much more. And all of this, I think, has contributed to a crisis of the relevance and purpose of the university, and also a crisis of relevance and purpose for many of us who work and study in the university. We see a significant and growing gap between what the university says it is, what it actually is and can be, and what we want it to be. And depending on how we approach these gaps, the VUCA context can either be understood as limiting possibilities for things like decolonization or creating new and unexpected cracks and openings for this work. And probably it's both at the same time. We'll have to be strategic about considering how we can leverage this VUCA context towards imagining different potentially decolonial futures. The second complexity of the social historical context that I want to name is that of information overload, basically the increased cacophony of perspectives, which contributes to the end of compelling meta-narrative, um, stable, stable epistemic authorities and hegemonies, as well as counter-hegemonies. And um, thinking about the implications of this for confronting colonialism in higher education, we can take the example of the different ranges of responses that come to university statements of their commitments to anti-racism and decolonization and unpack some of this. Um, so I think this is insights from my own university context. Um, we have in the middle the official university statement that they are committed to anti-racism and decolonization. And then we have all of the responses that come with that. Um, we have someone saying, including all these racialized people is threatening the excellence of our institution. So basically the reactionary racist response. Then someone saying, okay, I'm all for equality, but why do they have to keep shoving it down our throats? It's like the thought police. To someone saying, you know what? I don't wanna get involved in these politics. I just wanna do my work. My discipline is not actually political at all. I get this a lot from scientists, for instance. <laughs> and then someone saying, okay, well, maybe if I put some indigenous authors on the syllabus, they'll leave me alone and I won't have to think about it anymore. To someone then being really excited about this and saying, okay, finally, we're having this conversation. I've been waiting for it. Then a much more cynical person saying, okay, this is probably just a PR move, but I'm gonna use the fact that they said it to try and push for change and hold them accountable for that. Then the even more cynical person saying, this is really just a performance, nobody ac actually wants anything to change. And then the person saying, I'm not gonna engage at all unless they start by saying that they're gonna give land back. So <laughs> this is quite a range <laughs> of responses as you can see. Um, and I think that if we don't start by kind of mapping these responses that are happening at our university and where our colleagues and collaborators and maybe the opposite of those things are at, we won't be able to probably move somewhere different. Um, so I think starting with the honesty of this range and thinking, okay, if this is where we're at, what is possible, what is impossible right now, and thinking about that in the short, medium, and long term. So a kind of related to this cacophony is this polysemic confusion and contestation. Basically the idea that more than ever people are using the same words and phrases in multi-layered ways that challenge the idea of some kind of universal meaning or interpretation. And for those who are still really attached to, the, to logocentrism or basically the idea that reality can be neatly indexed and represented in language in static and universal ways, this is very annoying or frustrating, or they don't actually even see that the polysemy is happening. But we could potentially use it to our advantage as well if we're strategic about it. So just thinking about, again, an example of how this manifests in, in higher education and decolonization, um, we had 
uh, three different interpretations of, of decolonization. Again, this is drawing on my context in Canada, in the US. Um, we have the first people saying decolonization is basically minor reform. And the diagnosis of the problem is that the university excludes racialized people. That's the root cause understood of decolonization. So then the response to that is, OK, let's include more racialized faculty and students in the university, but not really change anything else and expecting them to adapt to the university, maybe adding in a few knowledges that are not Western to our syllabi. Now, the critiques of this approach from the major and beyond reform approaches that I'm going to review is that it's tokenistic. There's a lot of hidden costs of exclusion. And again, that the university is expecting those who it includes to um, have a debt to them, as opposed to seeing that it's actually the university that's indebted to those people. So decolonization as minor reform says that, OK, it's not just that the university excludes people, it's also that it exploits racialized people. And then the proposed response is not just including, but also redistributing money and resources and power and land, and not just including, but centering non-white people and non-Western knowledges. Now, the critiques of this position from the minor reform is that it goes too far. From the beyond reform folks, it doesn't go far enough. So decolonization as beyond reform basically says it's not just that the university excludes and exploits racialized people, it happens at their expense. So the proposed response is not just inclusion and redistribution, but also redress and restitution of stolen lives, lands, and resources, reparation, rematriation of land, and restitution. And of course, reducing harm in the meantime, as proposed by major and minor reform. So the minor reform says that this approach is um, unrealistic and unreasonable. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, major reform says this is typo. The major reform says it's unrealistic to ask for this, and the minor reform folks say this is totally unreasonable and can't we just move on already? So, again, it doesn't necessarily help us to. Um, we, we can spend a lot of time trying to argue over the meaning of decolonization, and in some contexts, that's actually extremely important. But in other contexts, it may not be the most strategic thing to do, but rather to be really good about scanning the room and seeing where people are at, and then seeing, again, where can we push and what are those leverage points that can enable different possibilities for confronting colonialism. Then there is the intensity of intergenerational conflicts, the increasing and um, significant gap between the ways that different generations are engaging reality, including the reality of the university, and the general lack of ability and willingness to translate um, between these contexts and thinking about how we might come together across differences to think about more responsible futures. So if we think about this in the university in general, um, we see this a frustration amongst younger generations about a lack of relevance of the coursework. Like, basically, we've had enough of the dead white guys already. Um, the idea of false promises, the sense that the university is a scam, like it's promising us these wonderful, abundant futures, when in reality we can see what's happening and we see that there's not a future for us. Then this critique that Andre really emphasized of the window dressing nature of much decolonization work, and then just this general sense relating to all of the above that there is no future or that the future has been stolen um, by, in, in my context, by, by older generations. And um, in a context here, it's not just older generations, but like the West itself as a whole, I would probably say. Um, and feeling that sense of economic insecurity, political instability, enduring inequities, and ecological crises. Now, thinking about this in the university, specifically in efforts to decolonize, decolonize higher education, there is a sense in some contexts of betrayal that younger generations feel in relation to older generations, like they compromise too much in their efforts to try and get into the university and change it, uh, that they're not radical enough and not pushing hard enough. Then conversely, there's a sense on the part of some older generations that younger generations are not grateful or appreciative of the work that older generations did in order to get to this place where it's possible to have this conversation and make this critique. And then between these groups, this competition over hegemony, like who's going to lead the movement and who decides where forward is. So I think we have this challenge of trying to learn how to process and share learnings from the past struggles in those contexts while respecting that coming generations are going to have different 
imagine futures and, and figuring out how we can actually work together across that um, in this decolonizing work. Then there's the fact that whether we recognize it or not, we are all facing multiple complex layers of reality. Essentially the fact that there's many different, often competing, often incommensurable ideas, concerns, accountabilities, and concerns happening all at once in any given space. Not everybody recognizes these multiple layers, and generally I would say that the people who tend to experience reality in more mono-layered ways are people who have more systemic privilege and advantage and less, they're less willing and less able to see these other layers because they've been socialized to think that their own reality is um, universal and they expect others to kind of adapt to that. So as a result, they're often confused or defensive when people say that actually, no, I experience this in a very different way than you have and you are not the universal determinant of what is real and important. Um, so thinking about these multiple moving layers of reality, um, Sometimes we think about, in my collective, this work as when we're intervening, we think about six M's of critique and how the critique is going to land in any given context, thinking about these multiple layers. So thinking about the message, what needs to be said to the audience in order to have a chance to land with them, the messenger, who is the person that is most able to give that message in that context and be heard and understood as legitimate, the motivation, like thinking about why would the audience be interested, especially if it's a critique that's implicating them, um, thinking about the method or mode of communication, which mode of delivery is going to land the best in that context, the mood or like the vibe of the audience and how to respond to that accordingly, and then the moon or like the timing and the context of the readiness of that audience to hear certain things. And we will need multiple different entry points for confronting colonialism. And thinking about these six M's can help us figure out where the entry points are in our context and how we can strategically work together in order to have multiple points of intervention or we might say attack. Then there's this oversaturation of unprocessed emotions, fears, anxieties, fragilities, and traumas, which can result in an overall lack of collective capacity to process difficult events and emotions within and around us. Um, again, especially those that are difficult emotions are perceived as negative and thus undesirable. And we tend to repress these emotions um, when, when we're feeling like they're causing us unease. But usually this is just a temporary fix and those emotions are gonna come out in one way or another. Or we um, look for a quick fix so that we can stop feeling that anymore. But both of these responses impair our ability to actually face the complex challenges like that of confronting colonialism. So just to kind of illustrate what this looks like, I took the guy who said, well, maybe if I put indigenous authors on my syllabus, they'll leave us alone. And thinking about the other things that he's saying, this internal complexity of, okay, I really don't want to talk about this because I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing then just genuine confusion, like why is this so important all of a sudden? When I was growing up or in university, this was not a conversation, to this fear about infringing on his academic freedom, or like, okay, is this really gonna be enough to keep me from getting critiqued? And then this feeling of sort of insufficiency, like they shouldn't expect me to teach these things, I'm not indigenous, I don't know about these things, and I haven't studied it. And then of course there's all the emotions that are happening too, the guilt, the shame, the fear, the anxiety, and if this person doesn't process all these things, it's likely going to come out in a either defensive or a reactionary way against decolonization and racial justice. So figuring out how we can support people to process these things in, in healthy ways that doesn't reproduce the problem. And then finally, the complexities of the trap of teleology. So within Western modern approaches to time and change, there's often an assumption that we can arrive at a different future by planning it out in advance and then mapping how we're gonna get there. And in this framework, hope about the future is sort of a projected image of an improved reality in a future time. And in this projection, we often, especially white people like myself, produce, reproduce a lot of colonial baggage. Um, but another way of looking at it is that if we actually want different futures, then we'll ha have to do different work in the present and difficult work of actually repairing relationships and enacting restitution for the harms done in the past as well as in the present and their accumulated effects. And perhaps in this process of relationship building, different futures can emerge. But most 
institutional processes of planning for the future, and even in many cases, movement building is also premised on this idea of a predetermined future. And if we say we don't know what the future is going to look like yet, then it's kind of dismissed as, well, then you have no vision and there's no point in engaging. So thinking about what this looks like in the university, um, or in, in general, um, different visions for the future university compete for hegemony, and it's generally those visions that are backed by the most institutional and social power that prevail over others, which then results in the continuity of colonial business as usual. If we focused instead on repairing relationships and enacting restitution in the present, and to working together to weave a different future, um, moving at the speed of trust and not any faster, then we might have the possibility of different futures, including perhaps decolonial futures. So in this hyper-complex, hyper-polarized context, how can we actually have honest, difficult conversations about the challenges, complexities, and possibilities of confronting colonialism in higher education across our many differences without seeking consensus and without relationships falling apart? Trying to bring people together across multiple differences to confront colonialism in a VUCA time is an enormous challenge. The social conditions that I just reviewed and many others mean that what previously worked in bringing people together is not working anymore. And whether that's through consensus or coercion, neither seem to be working. And part of the challenge is that while decolonization, in my view, is everyone's responsibility, and there's a lot of work we have to do together, depending on who we are and where we are, we'll also have to do very different kinds of work. So for instance, if I think about my teaching, what's optimal for the learning of my white students, for instance, developing their capacity to confront their complicity and harm, and grappling with those affective resistances to this conversation can be re-traumatizing for indigenous black and other racialized students to witness. Conversely, my indigenous black and racialized students want spaces where they can name their frustrations with colonialism and racism, without having to worry that they're going to activate the fragilities of their fellow white students. So very different conversations are needed, and yet we're often in these shared spaces where we don't have time and space for that. So the invitations that I'm going to review, and I'm going to do them quickly because I know time is running out, um, to take seven steps back and seven steps forward was created by my research collective to assist individuals, mostly in the global north, to address the complexities of bringing people together to respond to local and global challenges. And they particularly relate to racial and colonial dynamics in group processes and the processes of navigating different approaches to social change and problem solving. Um, I want to just preface one more caveat, um, that these invitations were created for a very specific context and a privileged audience. And they may or may not have relevance here. I mean, that goes for the whole talk. I thought I said that at the beginning, but I may have forgotten. Um, so if you feel that they're less relevant, that's totally fine. I'm not suggesting any of this is universal. That's part of the whole invitation of the talk is to contextualize this work and think about it in very provisional and contextually specific ways. Um, but even if it feels like these may not be relevant for your context, you can just think about, well, when I hear these steps, what is it teaching me about the complexities of what's happening in another context of decolonization? Or maybe they invite you to look at your context through different eyes. Or maybe you're thinking about, well, those questions don't seem to work, but what would similar questions look like in my context? Or maybe there's a group of people that you think really need to think about these questions in your context, and maybe you wish you could send that to them without them knowing it was you that sent it. <laughs> so the seven steps back. Um, stepping back from your self-image. What investments, fears, hopes, and intentions may be driving your approach to confronting colonialism, and where do these come from? What emotions, insecurities, and unexamined desires or unprocessed traumas could be driving your decisions? To what extent might these be limiting your capacity to coordinate meaningful change with others? Step two, step back from your generational cohort. Asking, how are the challenges of decolonization perceived and experienced by other generations than mine? What is your generation being called out on by the other generations? To what extent are the interests and concerns of incoming generations represented in your usual approach to confronting colonialism? Three, stepping back from the universalization of your social, cultural, and economic parameters of reality. How does your positionality prevent you from seeing and experiencing things? What are you projecting as real, normal, and desirable for everyone? 
How can these projections become harmful to others or limit possibilities for relationship building or coordinating approaches to confronting colonialism? Who could refuse to work with you on legitimate grounds? Four, step back from your immediate context and time. So thinking about how the challenges in your context reflect wider patterns of social change and historical, systemic, and structural forces. Thinking about what your perspective on the big picture is and how this might be limited. Five, stepping back from patterns of relationship building and problem solving that you've been socialized into. Thinking about what alternative ways of seeing, doing, being, and relating are already viable but unimaginable to you and those around you. What are you missing out on? This is something that I often ask people to try and invite them into this work um, because they feel often like they're losing a lot, which if they're taking it seriously, they probably will be. So what are they gaining as well? Who are you accountable to and how come? What accountabilities are you denying, rejecting, or neglecting? And what are you indifferent to and why? Six, stepping back from normalized patterns of elevating humanity above the rest of nature. To what extent and how is what un is unfolding a consequence of the perceived separation between humans and nature or the rendering of nature as property? How would you approach this differently if other species and non-human entities like rivers and coral reefs and mountains had legal personhood, like you could be actually held liable for damages, negligence, and ecocide, and if they had basically rights, the rights of nature. To what extent are the interests of other species represented in your approach to confronting colonialism in higher education? And then finally, stepping back from the impulse to find quick fixes, which relates to that teleological issue I named before. Thinking about what ways your approach to decolonization might be part of the problem you're trying to address. To what extent are you being driven by desires for innocence, benevolence, and hopefulness, basically the savior complex that white people like me love to embody? And how can these desires be harmful or detrimental to the work that you say you want to do? How can you leverage your recognition of systemic complicity and harm towards deeper forms of change? And to what extent are you actually equipped to develop relationships based on trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability? Okay. So having stepped back, what would you need to do to step forward? Or maybe it's just step to the side. I don't know. Forward has a lot of connotations that we might want to problematize as well. So stepping forward with honesty and courage to see what you don't want to see. Committing to expanding your capacity to sit with what is real, difficult, and painful, the good, the bad, the ugly, in, in yourself and in other people in the world around you. Asking how your projections and idealizations and fears and fragilities might be preventing you from approaching aspects of the problem that are unpleasant to deal with or that challenge your self-image. What problems are you still not ready and willing to sit with? And how does this impair your ability to interrupt colonialism in yourself and your institution? Two, stepping forward with humility to find strength in openness and vulnerability. Basically, the invitation to shed your conditioned arrogance and sense of self-importance in order to decenter yourself and center the challenge of confronting colonialism. Three, stepping forward with self-reflexivity so you can read yourself and learn to read the room. This is, again, something that many privileged people have a very hard time with. They haven't necessarily been forced to read the room and see how they're being read by room, the room. They expect the room to adapt to them. Um, but what would it look like for them to be able to step back and see uh, more layers of the context that they're not used to seeing and how that context is reading them, including in an unflattering ways and being OK with that? Four, stepping back to do the work on yourself so that you don't become work for other people. Identifying those harmful patterns of greed, vanity, arrogance, and indifference in yourself. And then thinking about how it is that we justify the continuity of those patterns. Five, stepping forward with maturity to do what is needed, even if it's inconvenient. Um, especially taking into account that mainstream society encourages and rewards us to deny our responsibility. Thinking about how we can actually grow up and accept intergenerational accountability. Six, stepping forward with expanded discernment. Um, basically, learning to do those kinds of le uh, layered readings of reality that I was talking about before. And then seven, stepping forward with adaptability, flexibility, and stamina for the long haul. And being prepared to fail, and to have your plans changed, and to change course, 
and actually learn to enjoy the struggle itself rather than the imagined prize at the end. So questions to, that I would propose to sort of debrief those questions, knowing that they might not be so relevant to this context, would be um, how would you assess your personal capacity to hold space for discomfort, uncertainty, and complexity in generative ways? How would you assess the collective capacity of people in your social or professional circles to do the same? Thinking about, in your context of work, to what extent non-white people can speak openly and critically without having negative responses or retaliation. And if you're a white person, how do you actually know? How do you usually respond when your worldviews or self-images are challenged? How do you respond when you're asked to face your complicity in harm? What do these responses tell you about your own internal complexity, attachments, and emotional maturity? And how can we view these responses as teaching us something, not necessarily as good or bad things? We say often accept that they're there without endorsing them. And then finally thinking about, if not these, which would be, make total sense, what kinds of steps forward and back might be relevant for your context? And then that's it. I actually beat the time, woo. <laughs> Um, thank you, Prof. Stain. Um, so we're going to have an open conversation. So if you have comments, questions, you can raise your hand. So we'll take about three hands uh, as the first round, and then give Prof. Stain an opportunity to respond, and then take another round as well. So there's one hand. <coughs> uh, there's another hand there as well, and a third hand. And yeah, so that's the first round, and then we'll have another round. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Sharon, for your presentation and give us, giving us a sense of what is happening uh, in your own particular context. And I can't help to think that after those caveats that you have thrown and the declarations, um, by the time you speak in our context, you would have been left with two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is just to say, you know, when you are here, we understand, so you can relax. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I'm interested in um, is the kind of the, na like the nature or the ideals mm. of the project of decolonialism mm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. What is the nature? What is it? I see the steps back and the, the very self-centered approach, a very individualistic approach to decolonial project, which becomes a structural problem, as we see in mm -hmm. South Africa. But how do you, for example, I'm interested in the ideas from different students in class. May They can be white, black, whatever. But it seems to me that um, if we are going to apply the complexity approach in our classrooms, maybe in, in this part of the, we may, need, we, we may be dealing with a, a serious fragile classroom. I'm sorry to say it like that. It becomes fragile. We cannot talk about the realities of the history and the structure that structures that history. Yeah, what? So, I'm, I'm interested, when we shift outside of the self in defining the actual nature and the ideals of the project, what happens? What is the nature of that society that you see in Canada or higher education in Canada? I hope it's clear. Thank you so much. So, I feel you can go ahead and Okay, I'm a bit loud. Uh, um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is <coughs> it's Apiwe Bizan. Good afternoon, Prof, to you too, specifically. Um, so I've done uh, some modest um, reading of your work um, ever since um, I knew that you were coming this side. And um, you, do, you do declare from the onset that you are a white settler 
And as I read your, your biography um, on the web page of your university, I, I also realized that you are also part of some um, social movements or community-based um, organizations. And in a way, you do, um, not so overtly, but you do, um, you know, position yourself, um, if um, I might say it, um, as an ally in the oppressor camp. Um, and I was just wondering, um, what are the ethical relations, you know, as an oppressed or between, between you as, as a settler and the oppressed people that you might be um, associated with um, through the work that you do? And how do you mediate um, those um, ethical relations and, 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 and potentially what could be the blind spots um, for you as a white settler that is perhaps taking up space uh, and you have throughout history um, hogged up space, you know, um, the over-representation of, 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 of white people and, and their views, you know. Um, so that's, that's the question that I wanted to ask. Thank you. Um, thank you, Apiwe. So we have one last hand for this round and then we'll, we'll give Prof an opportunity to respond. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Tando Soga. Um, okay. 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 Uh, Okay, my question is, um, since we are speaking in terms of decolonialization and also which in higher education, which will automatically lead to uh, the country's current state of affairs. Um, my question is, um, looking at the state or the current affairs of the country, um, as it stands, I believe that, okay, I've observed that, um, as a country, we are more prone to follow first world trends instead of looking at where we are as a country. I think it, we need to start from that one. Because as it stands, our country is poised as a developed uh, administrative state. And unfortunately, our education reflects that. Um, how do we then prioritize by creating uh, artisans, uh, technicians, by making use of these practical studies that we learn in higher education, that will help build the fabric of this country and empower people to solve their own problems and coming up with their own technical solutions. So that's my question. Um, thank you, so over to you, Prof. Okay, thank you. thank you for those excellent questions. I don't know how good my memory is, so you might have to remind me. Um, the first question about what the decolonization struggles actually look like in Canada and how this relates to the mm, white North American individualism as well. Kind of get, is that the gist? Outside the self. Outside the self, yeah. So the short answer to the first question of what it looks like is like, it depends, right? It depends who you ask. Um, there's definitely, the this movement for land back amongst indigenous peoples is becoming a priority and it's really freaking out the white people. Um, so I think to me the focus on the self is partly because that's that's where people are at. You kind of have to start and meet them at their individual differentiated self-interested self and try and invite them to unpack it. And I think that's the thing that we as white people most avoid we like don't want to look in the mirror and see all the horrors basically that we have been complicit in and are still complicit in so and i think if we don't do that work of unpacking with white people all of that shit basically um and ask them to start to compost it then they'll just be throwing shit around and like spreading it around even in decolonizing work and exactly this taking up more space with their unprocessed emotions. But that's also why I emphasize that, like, that doesn't have to necessarily be done in collective spaces. Like, it's, the, white people can do that in their own time and space and not come to the, like, table of collaboration and expect that to be the space where it's done because that just puts a lot more labor on, on the racialized and indigenous collaborators, right? That is not actually their work. It's the work of white people to do. Um, I don't know if that, do you, do you, okay, you can, we can come back to you if I, okay. <laughs> so then the question of taking up, it's a good question, 
I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, apart from that, I know this kind of work needs to be done, but it doesn't need to be done in every space. And then when I think about my responsibilities in doing this work, um, I mean, a lot of it, especially the community-based work, is about work, is about resources. Um, and like figuring out how to basically channel, uh, that's, I'll use that as a euphemism, university resources to the communities to do their own projects. And like focusing in, in the work with communities about supporting them to do that and finding the resource to do it. And then a little bit of them saying, okay, and this is what we want you to bring back to the university because this is what, like there is work that you need to do there because if you don't do that work here, then people are, then the problems still continue here because it's you people that are creating the problem. So they'd say like, this is what, this is the message we wanna relay back to the folks in the university. Um, and then working together with them to figure out how to do that in the most effective way possible. Um, that kind of translation work. But yeah, I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Like we, we, we have a place in this work as white people, but as you say, we often take up a lot of space and that's a huge bummer that we need to figure out how to address. And then the third question, I'm, I, it was a bit like muffled for me in, in hearing the question, um, like in the microphone. Uh, yeah, that would be very helpful. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Looking at the country's current affairs as an administrative state country, um, the question was how do we then prioritize? Because if you're looking at the people living in communities, some of them, uh, they only know of one way to success. So how do we then go and decolonize them in that space of the communities by prioritizing them using these practical studies that we are learning here at higher education, how do we then move whatever it is that we're learning here, move it to them so that they can be able to create um, their own uh, technical solutions and eventually solve their own problems? How do we then move it from here to them? I mean, I'll just speak about my context, which in like, that is the mode of the university to assume that we have answers um, that need to be then translated to the communities. And I think that is one of the things that we're trying to interrupt, like is assuming that we know anything about <laughs> what's best for the communities that we work with and actually just asking them like, well, what do you wanna do? And what, what can we do to support you to do that? Like, and in many cases, as I said, it's actually just about channeling funds in their direction so that they can do what they wanna do and figuring out how to frame that to the university like, okay, this is research so that we can actually use those funds in that way. And I don't wanna romanticize either, like the communities that we work with also have their own internal struggles and things that they're figuring out because they've been affected by colonialism as well. But definitely in terms of not taking up space, like not getting in the middle of that, but just asking like, what is it that we can do to support you, if anything, in this work? Um, that's kind of all I feel really comfortable saying as a white lady but probably there's lots of other folks that would have better answers than me. Um, thank you, Prof. So we're gonna go for another round and uh, I'm seeing t three hands already. So there's four. Okay, so there's... Yeah, th that's as many as my brain can remember. <laughs> okay, so we'll do three again. <laughs> um, I'll to the back. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I um, wanted to ask you about your use of the term racialized only for people who are not white, which seems to continue this idea that, you know, white people are not raced um, and, um, you know, are somehow occupying a universal position. Um, yeah, I find that somewhat problematic. I just thought maybe you could explain it. Okay, my, uh, my question is how is the transmo uh, transformation uh, work within the public sector and private sector around uh, uh, Canada, uh, from Canada? Sorry, can you say that the, the public and private sector? The transformation works 
like how, how do you implement uh -huh. yeah the implementation of transformation within public sector and private sector if it exists oh, that's amazing. around your country thank you oh, can i go um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was um, interesting, very, very interesting. Um, so I, obviously there are different types of colonizations, right? So I'm specifically interested in settler colonial societies and specifically interested in the role of a university in a settler colonial society. Um, given how um, in settler colonial studies, land is central um, uh, and also issues of reparation, but then also um, the fact that that university is then located in a society where there are entangled subjectivities, uh, people being to some extent forced living together at some instances, um, the anger that that generates, and that the violence that continues every day living together in that living togetherness. Um, so I'm very interested in this idea of the, uh, of the spatial decolonization. I know that um, Professor Mkise and Dr. Muzzolini wrote a very interesting paper on, on that. And I don't think we talk about that enough in South African society. Um, but I do see a lot of this taking place um, in my own work um, on language. Um, this call, this, these calls come up very strongly um, um, in terms of um, reclamation. So there's a clear call for reclamation. Um, but as part of a large understanding of reparation. So that's, that's, that, that's very central. Um, so um, beyond this idea of land acknowledgements, what is the role of a university in a settler colonial society, especially given the divisions between what we consider scientific and activist scholarship? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so as to the term racialized, yeah, I know that that um, I mean, this goes back to the like polysemy question, right? That these terms change over time and also in different contexts, they also vary a lot. Um, in Canada, for instance, there used to be a lot of use of the term visible minority to talk about um, people racialized as non-white. Um, that has kind of fallen out of favor. This is, that was new to me as a USian who moved to Canada. Mostly in, Ca in the US, we talk about people of color. Um, racialized is one imperfect way of describing um, non-white people, but uh, you're absolutely correct that whiteness is a race. It's certainly not the universal position from nowhere. Um, and I think the, the language we use really depends on what's gonna resonate in the context. So maybe, especially in this context, that's not the, that wouldn't have been the preferred way to, to introduce it, um, which is good feedback, so thank you. Um, Second, the nature of public and private sector transformation. Yeah, I mean, so in Canada, um, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015, which was fairly narrowly focused on um, Indian residential schools, which is the forced, um, and you could say kidnapping of indigenous children, 150,000 over 100 years. The last school was only closed in 1996. Um, so it was a national, supposedly, reckoning with that history. And the idea of, of reconciliation became, or has become, like it is a national conversation. Of course, the idea of reconciliation that many white people have is like, um, you know, sorry about that, but thanks for the real estate, like in a word. So there is a lot of um, pushback from indigenous peoples in Canada to say that's not what reconciliation is, or reconciliation is bullshit, we want decolonization and we want land back. Um, how that actually happens varies and depends on people's different strategies. Some people occupy places and say like, we are reoccupying the place that is already ours. Some people are trying to use um, legal mechanisms. So there's UNDRIP, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2021, Canada officially adopted UNDRIP and said that it was going to try and harmonize its laws with UNDRIP. It's very unclear to what extent that's actually going to happen or what it will look like. Um, I think if you take seriously what's in UNDRIP, then it really undermines the whole foundation of Canada as a settler colonial society. And the willingness of the Canadian government to do that seems very minimal, of course it would be. Um, but there are also uh, protected ter uh, treaty rights and um, inherent rights in the Canadian Constitution that have not necessarily been upheld and that people are fighting in court to uphold. My own institution has said that our approach to engagement with indigenous peoples and to climate justice work is also oriented by UNDRIP, 
which seems to me a, a very empty statement because we don't give uh, the, the free prior to informed consent or re require the free prior to informed consent of the Musqueam people in order to do things on campus or to exist on that campus. Um, but again, as the person who says, well, I think this is bullshit, but maybe we can do something with it. Like, if they say that it's happening, then there's a place to say, okay, you said you're following UNDRIP. Here's all the ways that you're not. So now what? So there's lots of different strategies that people have for how to move these things, but it's a very active conversation. Um, and there's a lot of frustrations on uh, the side of indigenous peoples. And then I'll like, fatigue on the part of white people, like, isn't this over yet? Can't we move on? And it's like, well, no, because mm, you're still colonizing the land, so <laughs> we're just getting started. Um, so uh, that's why I emphasize a lot the stamina that white people need to develop in order to like stay with this work over the long haul, because there's a lot of initial excitement on the part of white people. They get really indignant and like, oh, I can't, like, I didn't know this was happening, I can't believe it, we must change it. And then once it gets hard and complicated as it is in practice, then they just drop out because they can, whereas indigenous peoples don't have a choice. Like, this is their daily life. And so I think for white people, it also shouldn't be optional, but of course it is. So how to activate a sense of accountability where it's not optional is something that I'm trying to figure out, like some kind of alchemy where it's not even an intellectual choice, it's just, happens in the gut. The role of the university in land um, reclamation and, and rematriation is, is the question, right, for so many people like in an institution like mine. Um, there's a lot of, as I said, promises around UNDRIP and like collaboration with Musqueam Nation um, that I, don't, I can't speak for Musqueam, um, but there's a whole, for instance, site of the university that was given to them by the province after being stolen from Musqueam that they now use as this real estate money-making machine. So that on the one hand, they have this like river of gold as a, one article described it coming from this real estate development. And then the other side of their mouth, they're saying like, we're committed to, to reconciliation and to upholding UNDRIP. And of course, there's a huge incommensurability there. And then amongst Musqueam people or on other university contexts, there's a range of responses of strategies, like how are we gonna do what we can to move things a little bit or, or occupy the place and everything in between. Um, so, I mean, I guess the question just, and why I'm so skeptical as to whether universities can be decolonized is like, much like the Canadian state, why would they? Like, they would cease to exist as they are. Institutions like this, are produced and reproduced, like that's their whole purpose, is to reproduce themselves. So something that challenges that futurity is something that is extremely threatening, and then they have, would have different responses, which is either totally shutting it down, or as is happening a lot in Canada, co-opting it and saying that they're doing decolonization while business as usual continues. Um, thank you, Prof. So we're gonna go for the one last round because we're running out of time and we have two um, questions from Zoom so we'll take those first and then we'll have one last question um, here. Um, thanks so much, Fortunate. Um, the first question is from uh, Pedro Munzeleni. I think he wants to ask the question himself. Uh, Poncho, can we open up that Zoom? Um, Pedro, if you yeah. can unmute and ask your question. Ask your question. Well, I thank you for the presentation. First, uh, my name is Pedro from the Social Department of the University of the Free State. Uh, well, this side, I'm in a, I'm in a strange place. Um, I first realized that things such as uh, colonization and decolonization that were in normal language when I was at Mandela University, they required me here to first define them from scratch and also spend a lot of time trying to prove that they were real and that they actually exist. So the reality now is that here in South Africa, we had a TRC process where apartheid as a crime against humanity came out to, to be a crime that only had victims. Um, there were no perpetrators. White people in this instance, uh, therefore, still do not even acknowledge apartheid happened. And the dire need for reparations to black people is a conversation that doesn't even exist. So to begin now teaching them about decolonization would be another story. 
The question then is, uh, we must teach these white academics about decolonization. Um, is it still the black academic and the black student who must teach? Um, and isn't that further harm on black people actually, where they are where they are expected to double teach about their trauma? And this question is emerging from the reality of the South African context, especially here in Bloemfontein at the University of Free State. Yeah, that's my question, bro. Thanks. Okay, so Nati Nalani is currently the academic advisor for the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, she says she would firstly like to state from a student support perspective that decolonization, specifically within a scientific, mathematical and health point of view, is very tricky to navigate around. For example, how do you decolonize formulas? We've seen it as an institution, the movement towards inclusion of students in these conversations. However, the implementation of a way forward from student views thereafter is a mere 1% of their engagement with academics. This then leads to a lack of a better phrase, academic racial oppression, where you find students are now reluctant to participate in these conversations due to the fear of being academically oppressed. Is this the same in the Canadian higher education conversation? And then Tabo also po posted a question that I'll just add here. Um, since the land question has picked up momentum in Canada, what practices from the complexity approach have you utilized or even revised as a result of engaging with communities in Canada? Thanks everyone from Zoom. Okay, thank you so much for another round of excellent questions. Um, Pedro, it's such an important question and I think this this is where I think the white academic could be useful, which is that you can, if it, w it would be great if you had like white collaborators that you could just send these people to and say, go, go there, like this is not my problem. You guys need to figure it out together. Um, and I think that is like a role that I play in my collective is um, like working with other white people so that the racialized and indigenous people don't have to. Um, we actually have, and I'll mention another, like a few resources in responses to these questions, a poem called Why I Can't Hold Space for You um, that was authored by our collective that tries to articulate the frustration of um, black, indigenous, and other people of color of being asked to do this labor all the time, not just being asked to do it on top of everything else that they're doing, not just in the university, but in relation to their communities, but also being resented for doing it. Um, at the same time, so saying like, uh, you know, the poem tries to articulate like all the ways that white people don't even see that they're putting this labor on, on indigenous black and other people of color. Um, and they actually, like especially the racialized indigenous people in the collective wanted this to be something that we white academics brought to other spaces with white academics to work through their affective responses that get in the way of actual change happening. Um, and, and I'll, um, come back to the second question, but the third question about land. So there's another resource that we have. Um, I think it's called Returning the Land. These can be found on the Decolonial Futures website, where we have a thought experiment of what if you as a Canadian um, went to a Canadian national or provincial park and saw a petition that said, um, you know, enough is enough with colonialism. We need to, at the very least, um, have shared governance of these parks with indigenous nations and the Canadian government. And there should be 50% of the time where the parks are just for indigenous people so they can do what they want in terms of gathering plants, having ceremony on that land. And then we map different sort of clusters of responses that white people would have to this proposal so that people can see all the different mechanisms that white people use to uh, deflect responsibility um, from the like, you know, hell no, really racist responses to the sort of like, yeah, probably someone should do something about it, but it's not going to be me, to the sort of enthusiastic support of this initiative. And the point isn't to have people have any one response, is to have them engage with this exercise to see what comes up in them so they can work through and see where they're at. Because it's usually only when, like, it's all well and good for white people to say, oh yes, we support this, this, and this, but it's when we're challenged especially by black and indigenous colleagues, that we see like how much work we've actually done to be able to hear like really un unflattering things about ourselves. Um, so these exercises try and develop people's stamina to be able to hear those difficult, um, that difficult feedback. Um, now I'm sort of forgetting the second question about 
it was about students. Can you? The inclusion of students in conversation around decolonizing, decolonizing like things like whole science or the uh -huh. sciences, and how students find themselves um, academically oppressed in the classroom. And do you want to know if this is similar in Canadian higher education? Mm -hmm. um, in short, yes. Um, I, I mean, I can't speak for well, you know racialized indigenous black students in Canada, but my general impression is that um, they don't feel safe in the classroom with white professors or white fellow students. Um, and again, that white faculty and white students don't even realize what they're doing when this happens. Like, they don't, they don't see the harm that they're creating. And then it goes back to Pedro's question. It's the students have to decide, like, do I, do I point this out and then be labeled as the problem? Am I going to then be expected to do a lot of work to address the problem? And the answer is usually yes. Um, and it, then it becomes the student's problem as opposed to the, the, the problem of the faculty to deal with. Um, and I think that's another reason why, like, there's a lot of work to be done, although it can be individualizing on like working with white faculty to like see how they're not seeing the harm that they're producing, um, and to like balance the fact that it's a systemic problem. So it's not that like oh you're this uniquely bad person, but that like it's a systemic problem that lives in you. So what's your responsibility in relation to that problem as an individual? And trying to hold both of those things at the same time. Thank you, Prof. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, I know there were still hands up, but we can continue the conversation um, um, during refreshments. Um, so before I call Apiwe to do the vote of thanks, um, so the Center for Women and Gender Studies is hosting an event here tomorrow. Um, they are launching, it's a book launch and round table. Um, so it's the Guerrillas and Combative Mothers by Prof. Sipogazi Makala. And the time is from 1 p.m. until 3 p.m. So over to you, Apiwe. Um, thanks, Fortunate. Um, as introduced, I'm Apiwe Bizani. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Apiwe Bizani. I'm actually part of the Krishat team. Um, I'm a research assistant at Krishat. And my job here is quite simple, is to pass a vote of thanks um, but I think um, the following people um, bears um, some specification. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank you, Prof, um, on behalf of Krishat, uh, for such a, an amazing and intriguing um, lecture. Um, we normally say that um, in the indigenous language in this province, it's called Ilali Iabuler, which um, loosely translates to the village. Um, thanks you. I would also like to thank um, our facilitator, Fortunate. Um, I think by far you are one of the most democratic um, facilitators that I've, I've came across in, in our university. Um, but also I would like to thank the organizing team under the leadership of um, Dr. Dupriz, um, Dr. Mugabe, and Vimbiso. Um, but also I think it would be incorrect not to thank um, Cinema Enterprise for the catering and Mr. Mabena for the videography sound and also um, facilitating the, the Zoom platform. I think, I, think, I think colleagues, it would really be amiss um, not to thank um, Prof. Giet um, for basically encouraging and enabling this space to exist and, and the conversation attended to it. Um, we thank you very much, Prof. Um, it's difficult work that needs to be done. Do not get tired. We thank you, Prof. And <laughs> and and um, as you all might be aware, such conversations and events are nothing, are actually meaningless without the support of the community and participation of the community. Therefore, I would like to thank the Nelson Mandela University community, um, students and staff 
um, for actually missing um, the rugby game um, <laughs> and preferring um, this, this lecture. That, that, that is very profound, colleagues. You are duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it. I thank you all. Thank you, you. Um, you Apiwe, and refreshments are saved outside. Thank you.